Part 4 I think I should preemptively apologize to Ferret Badwan. He was the lead quest designer, as well as the lead designer for Fallout 76's post-launch content. We've been dogging his writing so far, but what's about to transpire is only going to get increasingly worse. Unfortunately, he passed away in October of last year. I really don't know much about the man, as he joined Bethesda after Skyrim with Fallout 4 and had worked on games like Dragon Age Origins and KOTOR 2. I think at the very least it's fair to say that he was given an exceptionally difficult task. He was not only expected to make a good story for 76, but to also deliver Bethesda a redemption arc through its post-launch patching. This is effectively the man who tried to fix Fallout 76. Please, please do not say that effort killed him. Oh, I'm not, I'm not supposed to read that part out loud. Look, I'll be honest, I want to say the same things regardless of whether or not the person responsible is still alive or not. Since Badwan is credited as being a senior designer on Starfield, and given the increasingly barebones nature of the DLCs, I think it's fair to say that he and the team he led did the best they could with the time that they were allotted, which is not a circumstance conducive to good art. Hopefully Starfield's delay means that Bethesda is effectively apologizing for both the launch date as well as the low quality of the DLC they made for this game. I mean, that all hinges on Starfield. One can hope this was a painful but valuable lesson for them. If not, then sit down and brace yourself for the Brotherhood of Steel Part 2, Steel Dawn. Okay, so the Vanilla Brotherhood is a bit of a self-contained package. It doesn't affect anything in future games because they're all dead. But now you've unquestionably redeemed the quality of Fallout 76 and want to bring back a staple faction of the series. How do you explain that? Already you've got problems. Maxon speaking with Taggarty was a bit of a stretch, but they explained it away with a limited time communication via satellite. Elder Maxon wants to follow up on what all happened, and so he sent an expeditionary force out to West Virginia, from California, in the post-apocalypse. Just a casual 4,000 kilometer stroll through the American Southwest, longer if you want to take a route that you might actually survive. I mean, a little further and it's basically a coast-to-coast -coast trip. If you did that right now, you'd be looking at six months. And if you did that in the post-apocalypse, I mean, the only world where I can imagine anyone greenlighting this bad idea is one in which the people assigned to it were desired dead. Crossing America on foot in six months is an athletic achievement owed in part to our road network and our ability to have relatively easy access to facilities and resources to support those endeavors. Without those things, a transcontinental crossing would take much longer. I'm sure it's possible, but five people roughing it across America is very hard to believe. Yeah. Five people, one paladin, three knights, one scribe. A single scribe. What if she had died of tuberculosis? And they had equipment. Best believe that because they're gonna make a big deal later about that equipment they were carrying. I can't see this story in any way other than being a suicide mission that they were bullheaded enough to actually survive. Can't wait to see how they mess this up. Cue us entering. We had found Fort Atlas earlier in the playthrough. It's hard to miss really but we gave it the big slip since we didn't want anything to do with the Brotherhood of Steel yet. At least, not this one. So we're back and we make our way to recruitment. Again, we get another line of dialogue that acknowledges something we did in the past before basically insulting us for even bothering to invoke it. Like yeah, I know we cheesed the system to become an initiate with the Brotherhood. I have nuclear weapon- How do you even really know about this? How am I not the first person to mention this to you? While it seems like the Brotherhood might have found out about the system, I doubt any of them would have anticipated someone actually being alive and having done it. People have only been back in this area for a year. By the way, a year passed in universe since Wastelanders. But this update came out in November of 2020. Point is that realistically, there has only been a year in which people have even had the chance to actually gain access to and fulfill the requirements of the automated system requirements that even the Vault 76 overseer had failed to fulfill. And Shin just blows it off like he's annoyed we're trying to return something without the receipt. I do not understand this decision. You decided to make a DLC focused on a faction that was already in the game, and did nothing to connect it to the existing questline. The reason being, we need to do Shin's job for him. No, really. He wants us to talk to some people in his stead. 
These are all important characters to the Steel Story saga. No, seriously, three of them recur, and the fourth? Well, let's just talk about him now. Sean is here to complain that he was robbed by people claiming to be the Brotherhood. I was surprised to see this guy because, after having completed both Steel Dawn and Steel Rain, I realized that the other three characters had been reused, but not this guy. And then I realized what this was supposed to be saying. The people who had robbed him were 76 dwellers who had completed Taggarty's initiation, started LARPing as the Brotherhood, and then turned into raiders during the Wastelanders expansion. In other words, the only point of this gentleman in the story is to further discredit the Brotherhood of Steel section of the main quest. I gotta ask, because I drew blanks here, is there a game that had story DLC for it, which hated its original plotline to the degree that Fallout 76's DLC does? Honestly, if they had just fixed the game and left it alone, I think this is the main quest that people would have eventually come around to liking. You would have seen tons of YouTube videos about the unredeemed potential of Fallout 76. Art wants protection in exchange for food, which we won't give because the organization's like four people and a bunch of randoms. Tally wants guns, which the Brotherhood isn't going to give because they hoard tech. That's fine because it's establishing exposition about the faction that the player would not have gotten from the Brotherhood section of the main quest. And Doc Blackburn wants medical supplies for his secret lab where he's making super mutants, but he's asked incorrectly and so we have to let him go. Only problem, they already lampshaded where the orcs were coming from. The Enclave released them to raise the DEFCON rating. Okay, so what are the odds that the Brotherhood of Steel, who formed in an incident related to the FEV, would contact another unit and create a new chapter and then send an expedition out to that same region where there was not one, but two separate conspiracies where people were messing with super mutants. There's supposed to be all kinds of unique mutations in different places, and yet we insist on shoving in the same factions and the same enemies that were in all the other Fallout games. Okay, just have to be positive, assume this is someone's first Fallout game, and so this information is just for people who might not know who these groups are. Wait. If that's the target demographic, then why even bother with the Brotherhood, since new players aren't going to recognize them? Oh god, we're still on the first quest. Shin is impressed we did his paperwork and sends us inside to meet Scribe Valdez. We need both their validation before the Paladin will accept us as an initiate. You know, doing people's work for them without pay is kind of a metaphor for Bethesda and its fan base. Modders fix their games seeking to join Bethesda. The only difference is that in the real world, they don't hire you. Instead, the questline is a bit like an uncomfortable metaphor for working in retail. We're getting taken on as seasonal employees during a probationary period, probably shipped off to go work on some garbage live service game when all I wanted to do was make an Elder Scroll. Valdez is more of an introduction to the scribe life, not that we'll be given an option. I kind of like her, in large part because she's a female character, doesn't seek to put the player down at every opportunity. I know. All you had to do to write a female character that I would like was to actually write a woman who isn't spiteful, paranoid, condescending, or rude, but is proactive, capable, and open-minded. Don't worry though, Steel Dawn will hit its quota soon enough. The Brotherhood is so behind on their game, they haven't actually even figured out what's up with the Observatory, which was one of the primary objectives, by the way. I don't really know why Maxon cared about a radio telescope when I'm sure there were a billion better targets that would have actually resulted in useful information within a decade. Also, please appreciate that I did all of this in Enclave Power Armor. It is very ironic. Thank you. Valdez's quest is surprisingly good at setting a tone for the bro- Oh, hang on, radiation rumbles up. Sorry, yeah, you know, it's just I gotta farm that bully in an XP. I'll be back in like an hour to continue this story. While I could, of course, say this about any point in the Fallout 76 storyline, it's valid here because this actually happened. We dropped the storyline to go farm an event and we're gone for over an hour. I don't think good stories could survive the start-stop pacing that events bring, but at the same time, I feel that if this was a good story, I would not be racing off to go do events instead. I was more engaged in doing an event I had already completed multiple times than I was in seeing what this new story was about, because already I felt in just the short time that we have covered that Steel Dawn was just going to be more of the same garbage. At least I get to shooty shooty bang bang a bunch of ghouls with strangers on the internet. Also, the quests still don't work in co-op. Yeah, I made sure to continue checking with each update just to see if these were still supposed to be single player stories. I guess that feedback either wasn't made or wasn't important enough to address. It's the same issues, but this storyline only has a single path to go down. I guess that thankfully means that 
nobody has to ever replay it to get all the achievements. No, seriously. Someone in my server complained about having to replay the gold heist story for the other faction to 100% the game. So I can only imagine that was an actual criticism they wanted to address. Mind you, I agree, but that was because Wastelanders was garbage. The best way to fix bad writing is not to reduce the amount of time someone has to spend with it. I mean, it can be, but I like to think people could actually improve instead of needing to be fired and replaced. Now, I'll ask you, what was happening when we were last doing this quest? Yeah, exactly, I think New Vegas would struggle with random events like this. We are investigating Fort Atlas because it has a mysterious power source called Ultrasight. Ultrasight was supposed to revolutionize the energy sector, so the only reason I can think of to establish it this early is to make sure the player is well aware that this entire chapter of the Brotherhood is doomed to die. It's a prequel, and we never hear about this later, so it's hard to believe any of this will mean anything. I think a part of the problem is that the rewards for doing these quests themselves are exceptionally minor. So if it becomes a choice between doing these quests and doing events, most players are going to favor events. If the quest rewards were a bit more in line as a valuable usage of time, then maybe this wouldn't be a problem. There are a lot of opportunities to prove yourself to Valdez, but it does not go anywhere. You can't become a scribe, you'll get a recommendation regardless, and her only flirt option is her final dialogue in Steel Rain. No, seriously, they decided to start doing flirt options in the second part of the storyline, for the Brotherhood of Steel. It's almost like whoever made this is just doing a parody story that will fly by management because nobody actually cares about what is in Fallout 76. Like, it's almost making fun of the weird romances that are in RPGs in general, which are even in Fallout 76. Yeah, so during Wastelanders, there was this guy we met named Beckett, and we started doing his quests, but it just seemed kind of boring, like we were just going to be killing raiders, so we blew it off as not being worth mentioning. Turns out, if we had done it, because I played a female character, I would have gotten some awkward romance dialogue. I'm sorry sir, but this is a multiplayer game. Uh, given how ill-equipped Fallout 76 is to tell regular stories, I cannot imagine romance ever being a good idea. Which makes its bizarre inclusion here all the more perplexing. If it's known to be out of the scope of what the game could accomplish, maybe it's better to just leave that stuff up to the players? I mean, I am told people play this game with their partners. I don't know why you'd want to strain your relationship like that, but sure. Steel Dawn does award unique weapons for its quests. For instance, this one awards a 44 revolver with the effects 2-shot, explosive, and reduced AP cost. But while that could be a good reward for someone out there, I think a lot of people would still prefer the gambling thrill of rolling legendary weapons through events, rather than the handful of pre-made legendary items that we end up selling. It is a tricky situation to be sure, but I think in a lot of ways the experience of the content should be a reward in itself in a game like this, and so the content just isn't rewarding enough with its experience. Which is evidenced largely by the fact that despite having played it more recently, I have difficulty remembering the sequence of events that constitutes the Brotherhood storyline. I was able to at least remember Wastelanders, the main quest, and most of the public events, with Valdez and Shin's support, Romani's willing to make us a probationary initiate, but she still wants to see how we'll handle working without supervision. This really is the retail experience. We got an hour's worth of on-site training and things that have nothing to do with our job, and now we're just being cut loose to fend for ourselves while management has no intention of keeping us around. It's at least not a bad premise. Paladin Romani wants to encourage a positive image of the Brotherhood with the settlers moving to Appalachia, so she's sending us to deal with a feral ghoul nest. It's appropriate. This isn't a super important assignment for their overall mission that we've been tasked with due to us proving our aptitude for paperwork. If we can do this, we are useful. And if we can't, then it doesn't really hurt the Brotherhood's image. Sadly, we had actually been to both places that this quest sends us to. This is the reason we couldn't kill you folks earlier. Let's find out. The first is a farm that we awkwardly stumbled across early on. Also sad, of course, was the slow realization that any location we had- I say awkwardly as the DLC seems almost completely unprepared for the possibility of players entering this house before the predefined point in the questline. The encounter also seemed to break, either because we had visited it before, or because it took so long to load that I had made it past someone who's supposed to threaten us at the door. I also did not seem to pick up that I was supposed to be only interested in recruiting one of their sons, not both. Not that it mattered. 
Something was really weird about the Putnam homestead, and not in the intentional murderous aura kind of way, just in a sad, broken game style. So we headed out to where we were told the nest was, which was another dungeon that we had completed during our exploration, which turned out to be plot relevant. Also sad, of course. It's really disappointing every time this happens. The son we picked comes to fight alongside us, which I guess is the moment where the choice is supposed to matter. I think, in theory. Our quest for Shin and Valdez were meant to highlight the differences between knights and scribes, and these brothers are supposed to be that difference. But it's hard to really distinguish because the quests are so generic, there wouldn't be any value in replaying it to see it from the other perspective. It's not like we're becoming an initiate who will then get to choose a scribe or knight career. These boys could actually be useful in serving the opposing role that we don't choose in the story, if that were the case. See, it's the usual problem of there being a new faction that should be fully recruiting that we can join, but we get given a special role which is important but separate from the other people. When really, if Romani's objective is to build an Appalachian chapter, then the whole story should be about widespread recruitment. Given this is an MMO, it would fit if the player was just another member but given a couple options about roles they want to fill within the Brotherhood. MMOs can get away with having narratively simpler quests, unless you're trying to pretend that you aren't making an MMO. The worst thing you could do is write the story like we're yet another protagonist. Speaking of, since we've proven, without third-party verification other than the word of some guy, that we can operate alone, we are given another assignment. This one is much more important, at least to Romani. This is the start of the Hellstorm Rocket drama. I call it a drama because to call it a story is an insult to the majority of human literature. Okay, so after the Sierra Nevada Mountains, the expedition was four people. Romani, Shin, Another Knight, and Valdez. Good job protecting your only scribe on this mission, considering most of your operational objectives would have been impossible had she died. While on this trip, the expedition came across the settlement being harassed by raiders. Romani, as the leader, made the decision to assist the settlement by supplying them with weapons. Now, you might say that breaks the traditional rules of the Brotherhood, but that's actually kind of the point. Romani made an impulsive, moral decision. The weird part, though, is that the story tries to pitch this as having been a bad thing. The settlement got destroyed. The drama tries to suggest that this was the Brotherhood's fault, somehow. I figure if your settlement was destroyed when you had rocket launchers, you probably weren't going to stand a chance without. But, you know, screw them for trying, right? It tries to reinforce this later by showcasing that when Foundation got their hands on one, the people practicing with it accidentally killed themselves. I mean, the real problem isn't that the Brotherhood tried to help, only that they had lost control of the Ordnance after the Raiders seized the launchers, and that they've been proliferating around since. This is in line with the general Brotherhood philosophy of not sharing their weapons with non-Brotherhood personnel. Granted, I feel it's inevitably a self-controlling problem, like how many rockets could be floating around to feed these things. It runs up against the same general problem with the expedition, so they found these on their way to Appalachia, but why did they take so many with them? And what exactly is the point here? That the Brotherhood was absolutely right to not ever help settlers? That settlers are too incompetent to have access to weapons? The wedge between Romani and Shin over this incident is not a good enough reason because it doesn't go anywhere fast enough. Romani wants us to contact a new settlement out in the mire and help them deal with a Blood Eagle problem. I love that Bethesda's drawing attention to this new town full of NPCs they have, which serves no functional purpose outside of this quest. I guess I shouldn't have to explain this, but here we are. If you introduce something with a quest, that something should generally serve a role in your product. For example, if you get a quest to visit a new town, that town should be full of yet more content and services useful to the player. The town shouldn't exist for the sake of the quest, rather the quest should steer players to the content that you made. But, what happens if you didn't make a new town, but need one to simulate a conflict characters in the past had to try and give the player perspective on them? Well, then you have to invent one. That said, though, there's one key problem with this metaphor, which is that we're taking a completely different approach to the raider problem. Military intervention. Still in your uh, Slenderman mode. 
think that makes it better. <laughs> it really does. You may have noticed if you've been watching the footage that my character is in possession of a jetpack. Originally limited to just power armor, Wastelanders added it to the Secret Service armor set. The chest piece and jetpack mod are some of the only things I managed to actually buy with gold bullion, largely because they, combined, have a price tag of 3,250 bars. Remember, you can generate 400 a day and 300 extra a week totaling 3100 bullion per week. And that's hard grinding. Getting 40 treasury notes a day is an involved process. Of course, Steel Dawn added a new armor set, Brotherhood Recon, which also has the jetpack. But to get the plans for recon armor, you know that's a weird thing to say if you were there for Halo 3 when it came out. To get the plans for recon armor, you have to do daily ops. And you have to roll against an extremely convoluted loot table. Seriously, look at this thing. So you get like one chance per day to get the plans for the recon chest, which you then have to spend 2,000 bullion at the secret service vendor to get the jetpack plans for. In mind, the jetpack isn't even anything particularly stand out. It has a huge AP cost to use, is susceptible to lag, and adds an extra function to the jump key. Why is that a problem? Basically, the jetpack being added post-launch to stuff it was never designed to be attached to created an issue. You cannot rebind the VAT's critical hit button, which is the spacebar. And since the meta is fixer spamming VAT's crits, you'll come out of VAT's and immediately start jumping, which you may also have seen. The solution is to, not kidding, rebind the jump key. As in, towards the end of my playthrough, I was using the E key to jump like this was Morrowind. But as to the jetpacks, it's not really that fun because Bethesda limited the hell out of them. That didn't stop players from building around the jetpack and doing all those things Bethesda is scared players will do with vertical mobility, but it just means that by default it's kind of a weak addition and also ugly. They are putting a jetpack into Starfield though, so maybe this was testing ideas about how to work with that idea. Uh, that's fine I guess, but why did it have to be so expensive? Oh yeah, so people who play Fallout 76 like a job don't run out of bullion so quickly. I should also mention Minerva, who is the fourth bullion vendor. I know this is a tangent, and maybe I should have explained it in Wastelanders, but screw it. Here's your break from the Brotherhood story. They added her in Steel Rain anyways. To keep track, there is the Secret Service vendor who sells high-level plans. There is a vendor for the Settlers and Raiders that sell rep-gated gear. And then there's Minerva, a traveling limited time vendor who has a rotating stock. So you'll also want to try to keep track of her because you can buy the Secret Service chest piece on sale and the recon armor at all, but only for a limited time and maybe if she has the inventory list with the items you want on it. She has 24 lists, the recon armor is on lists 7 and 8. She sells one list per week, and there are 24 lists, meaning that it takes six months for a list to be made available for sale again. Given that Recon is on two consecutive lists, this means that it's literally unavailable for purchase for half the year, and then gets listed for two weeks in a row. Like, wouldn't you want it to be on lists 7 and 19 so that it at least appears more often? But even better, Minerva isn't available for the entire week. No. For three weeks, she'll appear at noon Monday through noon Wednesday, and then on the fourth week she appears on noon Thursday through noon Monday. For the four weeks we played, two of which we didn't even have access to bullion, the only thing of value she sold was the recon jetpack for a whopping 25% off, saving you 500 bullion or a single day in a change of progress. So in other words, you go through the process of investigating Minerva, what she sells and when, 
only to find out that she saved you a grand total of like a day of progress for the pain of tracking her down. And it's not like she's a particularly obvious vendor located in a central area that players might be curious about. I literally only found out about her because of the fandom pages. Another thing I wanted was the Gauss shotgun, because I was running a shotgun build and was desperate to try anything other than the three options I had. But, for whatever reason, the plans for the Gauss shoddy are 500 bullion easy, but require max settler rep. Fandom says Minerva also sells the Gauss shoddy plans. Cool, right? Guess when? That's right. Lists 7 and 8, which was a full month before we started playing and will only appear 4 months after we stopped. Okay, my brain is hurting. Did you know there's a bullion cap at 10,000? Don't bother trying to save for everything Minerva sells, given the total cost you'll have to hold while waiting 6 months is likely going to be greater than the gold cap. Oh, and by the way, the only other shotgun added by the DLC is the Pepper Shaker, which is only available during Meat Week as a rare reward, and Meat Week only happens in August and September, except in 2021 when Bethesda decided that it wouldn't happen in September, but that it would happen in April of 2022. I love limited time, semi-predictable events. I don't know what MMOs the designers have played that inspired the system, but they can f*** off. Remember, only after you get these items are you allowed to play the G-Roll lottery to get your perfect item. The only way I can justify the huge amount of RNG would be if the game was 100% transparent about this stuff. You have no guarantees of getting items that existed previously but you are given a hard list of what items you could acquire if you play concurrently, and what all the percentage chances are. It is ridiculous that only in retrospect can I look at this game and realize that I wasted my time with certain grinds that weren't going to mathematically pan out. And Minerva in general seems to be designed very spitefully. I think the goal was to have something Bethesda could point to in order to say that progress through daily ops was not 100% random but was actually a ploy to get people to play every week. What, don't want to miss out on your limited time opportunity to get these items, do you? What even are daily ops? Turns out the update that preceded Steel Dawn added a single quest that explains what daily ops are. Oh. Okay. Well, we missed that. That explains why we didn't know who Initiate Dodge was. Even better, he's a surviving member of Taggarty's chapter. Seriously, what? This game has the amazing property of being even stranger and more bizarre the further down the rabbit hole you go. Where a normal game might give you a quest to introduce yourself to this guy and the daily ops, Fallout 76 does not. Fallout 76 knows its audience. Fallout 76 knows that its audience, if they really care, will just look up where to find the quest. Okay, so, since I started talking about jetpacks, this was all an insert in editing. It really is astonishing how much information about this game I'm learning months after having played it exhaustively. Let there be no doubt that Fallout 76 really is worse than you know. So to catch you back up, we just wiped out our bunch of raiders attacking a settlement because it turns out that military interventionism is something the Brotherhood should have been doing. You can still choose to give a launcher to the settlement if you want, which is probably dangerous given how these things seem to have a habit of killing their untrained users, mostly at this stage. All your choices hinge around which of your managers you want to brown nose so that they keep you once your 90 day probationary period expires. Shin has a very no nonsense classic brotherhood mentality. Romani's more emotional, making moral decisions even if they violate company policy. And that's the big reason Maxon approved of her mission despite the Council of Elders leaning more towards Shin's attitude. Yes, it is another situation where a male and female character are directly contrasted where the male is reasonable, effective, and consistent, while the female counterpart is emotionally impulsive and irrational, making self-sabotaging decisions. Okay, in fairness, at least this time Shin is actually the rude one, while Romani just seems to have difficulty making eye contact. But it's hard to say that Shin is wrong, and it's only going to get easier to side with him as events progress. Mostly he's got that rare hot Asian guy as that. Shin actually wants to follow up on the launchers, since getting that under control is the sensible thing to do. So we're gonna have to go talk to the Raiders. You know, the Raiders. The gang that is apparently just called Raiders, not their actual name, which is the Diehards. Yeah, so we're following up on the proliferation of mediocre rocket launchers and not on the guys in power armor robbing people while calling themselves Brotherhood. Hey, no complaints from me. Any chance to kill raiders in New Virginia is a golden opportunity. Not looking to negotiate? Well, I won't sit back. Brotherhood, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that hurts. We 
Sadly, we can't kill all of them, as one of the raiders is flagged as essential. He's hardly the first NPC added post-launch to be so, but definitely one of the worst. He is supposed to have a dialogue where we initially negotiate with him, but I just closed out of that and started blasting. But he's a typical modern Twitter anarchist, quickly throwing himself to his knees. To surrender, guys, come on. He somehow knows that Brotherhood Knights have a rule against killing prisoners, so he's basically tagging safe and abusing the rules. Guys, cops aren't allowed to hurt you after they arrest you. Please ignore my previous 1,000 tweets about police brutality. I'm not bound to that code, Shin, since you guys never actually initiated me. But I also think it's hilariously pathetic. Pierce is banking pretty much everything on the morality of people he literally calls fascists, and of course, the game isn't going to allow me to call that bluff. We are the Enclave. I have nuclear weapons. Pierce is just an annoying character that despite coming back later, the story really does nothing with. I don't have much patience for people who think the Brotherhood are a bad thing, yet are themselves literal parasites who rely on highway robberies to stay alive. There's a reason many places in the world will cut off the hands of thieves, if not outright execute them. More than that, Crater is the remains of a satellite which the raiders use to spy on communications to coordinate their attacks. Meaning that realistically, the Brotherhood should be eyeing Crater pretty hard as their next target. You would satisfy Romani's desire to ingratiate the Brotherhood into the local community, Shin's desire to prove that the Brotherhood is not an organization that can be taken advantage of, and Valdez's desire to actually study technology. And you'd be taking the tools raiders utilize to attack settlers away from them, which is going to accomplish a hell of a lot more than resecuring some rocket launchers. The only problem with that is, of course, the writer's thinly veiled fetish for spunk. I don't understand why this was treated as a completely valid and acceptable solution to the Blood Eagle problem just one quest to go, but is no longer a valid option. No, we need Pierce alive so he can tell us where he got his launcher, and Shen wants us on our own to meet him at Crater. Guess I'll go die. Pierce still isn't cooperative, which is reason enough to just kill him now, but his friend will tell us if we use a holotape to download Brotherhood data that the raiders will use to prepare ambushes. Why do I get the feeling I'm gonna load this tape into a terminal and the Brotherhood are gonna find out? But they're not gonna be mad and kick me out because I, they still need me to complete the rest of their quests. I cannot imagine anybody taking this storyline seriously actually going through with this request. It's just such an insane choice that means literally nothing. This isn't where the questline branches off and we can rejoin the raiders because we think the Brotherhood needs to be stopped. You can give them fake data from Valdez and things will proceed exactly the same. And later she'll act surprised that the Brotherhood initiate did not in fact betray the Brotherhood. Some other fun details I noticed in editing, had I used a speech check to avoid gutting down Pierce's friends, the questline would have gone a full two hours of just being fast travel to place, talk to person. It is amazing how amateur the writing is for Steel Dawn. For instance, Pierce refuses to give us information, and Shin refuses to execute him. But he says he'll only talk to us if we meet him at a second location. We go to the second location, but he refuses. He does not use this as an opportunity to stage a second, more difficult combat encounter. It is just a dialogue where violence isn't allowed to happen. Then we have a conversation with a new character. So Pierce's only purpose is to facilitate us getting from the raider lead to another raider lead. Most final drafts would just cut out the middleman here, either have Pierce accept that he has to compromise his virtues and cooperate, or cut his character and have What's-Her-Name be who we met at the bunker. You would think that, given that we are trespassing in Pierce's private headquarters, he would be staring intently at us and listening to every conversation we have, that he would interject before we'd even get the proposal to use the holotape. You would need the second character to introduce a third location to have a private conversation, but that would be silly, because the second character already wants us to go to a third location. This is not how you pace scenes in a story. The game being dialogue and location heavy would not be a problem if it was good at either. Fallout 76 is still the stronger game when it comes to using combat encounters over conversations, so the fact that it's trying to make narrative quests without combat means that you are just fast traveling and having some of the worst conversations. Literally the only thing I hate in Fallout more than the Brotherhood of Steel are Bethesda Raiders, so you could imagine how nightmarish a sequence crossing these elements over really is. 
I want you to seriously think about everything that has happened in this video up until now and tell me that you don't believe this to be the lowest point yet. Tell me that you still think Fallout 76's main quest was bad. Tell me that you unironically believe that Bethesda made the game better. Good lord, let's just get this over with. We go to Foundation and make a trade agreement that doesn't actually matter and get our hands on the rocket launcher they purchased. Why is it that I can shoot the kid who killed his friends on accident, but the literal raider who is the president of the anti-brotherhood club is off limits? Paladin Romani finally has time to meet with Valdez. I don't know how, considering she just spends all day hanging out at Fort Atlas, but sure. I mean, I get it. The store manager works mornings, but Valdez's department is nights, and getting the manager to come in during the evening for meetings is just such a hassle. Valdez has found a way to contact the Council of Elders, but Romani doesn't want that to happen. I hope she doesn't do something really stupid at the end of this. I like that Valdez gets in trouble for doing this, even though it's completely within reason given that it was literally her mission to study the observatory and then phone back to headquarters. It's very realistic for someone competent to get in trouble for doing the right thing without permission. We clear out an enclave facility run by an AI named Sodas, thankfully sparing our boy back at White Springs. As usual, our status in the Enclave is acknowledged before immediately accomplishing nothing. I would be so happy if there were two doors, and being in the Enclave meant we got to skip one or two combat encounters by using the second door. That's literally what happened in the Wayward questline of all stories. Assaultrons are military-grade hardware, Spirit. As such, all of our machines have already been spoken for. Outstanding deal with the United States military just waiting for pickup. You understand. I'm part of the United States military. Oh, you, holy <clears throat> shit, it actually lets you do that. What? Oh, right, that was another faction that we had to join. Oh, I wish you'd said so sooner. Deepest apologies, I feel like General. this is a lie I could have told. You are. The like, frame's I don't upstairs. even have to flash my government ID. I mean, I have the fucking government ID. One dungeon later and we've secured us a very low frequency transmitter powered by the ultrasight battery we found earlier. Shin and Romani arrive to secure the credit in the eyes of the district manager, but then Romani flies off the handle. She has a better idea. Rather than calling district and admitting that she lost the missile launcher she had also found and gotten one of her employees killed, She's gonna break the transmitter. <laughs> what? <laughs> Seriously? Why Romani isn't shot on the spot by Shen is a mystery I shall never understand the answer to. Seriously, the whole point of the Brotherhood is the preservation of technology. A mission that Romani should remember being a first generation member. I want you to consider that this transmitter could be the perfect communication line between the New California Republic, New Virginia, and any other East Coast states which form. Our operational mission is the rebuilding of America, and tech like this would be extremely valuable in accomplishing our objective quickly. Cavewoman SMASH! This singular action could be a critical reason why the East Coast is still a desolate wreck 200 years after the war while the West Coast has multiple functional governments with currencies and resources. And she did this because talking to her boss would be awkward. She can't take that risk. What if Maxon decides to promote Shin to Paladin? Who cares? They're three time zones away. Come out here and enforce anything. Oh wait, I forgot. We're only a couple days hike from California. When I was joking about Bethesda being misogynists, I kind of wasn't. Because when I wrote those jokes, I'd already played this questline. I'd already seen the trend this game has. The female option just made one of the most neurotic and insane decisions I've seen a character in these games in general make. And I'm seriously supposed to entertain siding with her? Luckily, Private Sessions was available to sim for her while I sided with Shin. Not that it matters until the very end of the next expansion. Seriously, the choice is a Skyrim-style T-intersection decision that players at the time had to wait eight months for. I mean, there's one more quest where the execution of Romani's delayed because we have to set up a cliffhanger of a super mutant attack at Fort Atlas. 
Brothers and sisters, we've made it to the final part of the Brotherhood of Steel in 76, and you'll have to forgive me because I'm going to go through this with greater haste. Fallout 76 has a characteristic of really wearing on the soul. At this point, it just deserves to be put out of its misery. The benefit of Steel Rain is that, because it's a sequel to Steel Dawn, players can't just jump in and start doing these quests like they could have previously. The downside, of course, is that Steel Dawn was not a good foundation for a two-act play. You would think that the transmitter drama would have served as the basis of a two-sided conflict, and that justified taking another eight months to complete the storyline. I mean, the benefit of that, of course, is that the Appalachian chapter can't survive Fallout 76. So wiping themselves out through a civil war because Romani was a terrible leader is a neat bow with which you may tie this package. But, because the source of this entire conflict is that Romani decided to paint Brotherhood sigils on the side of rocket launchers before losing them, it's hard for me to seriously entertain any position other than Shin did literally nothing wrong. But nothing brings a family back together like a threat that already existed in Appalachia and that you would have met already, the Orcs. While Bethesda's never been good at using threats like the Super Mutants or Scorch, this is a case where I have to wonder, are they zombies? I mean, they broke in pretty intelligently, for them to just sit in the tunnel and attack in waves for hours. There are plenty of decent ways to make use of Super Mutants, but it probably isn't great if your strategy is Bloon's Tower Defense. This feels more like one of the Mole Miner attacks, only the Mole Miners aren't a nostalgic staple of Fallout, so we aren't allowed to use them here. Plus, Steel Rain is going to be about Super Mutants, so... And no, as far as I'm aware, there's not a reason for the Super Mutant attack. Why they attacked the Brotherhood, and why they did it in this particular way. I mean, the attack has to happen this way so that the schism is put on pause. The Brotherhood can fight their classic foe, the attack isn't over by the time we return to base, but we can still permanently end the threat. Also, the game can't do an exterior defense sequence because every part of the story has to take place within an interior instance. Remember that little gameplay limitation? You didn't think that was actually going to create problems for the story, did ya? I'd do a simple rewrite. Actually, it's not simple, but whatever. Foundation refuses to make the protection deal, so the Brotherhood has to rely on that village in the mire for food. You know, the one you can potentially leave a launcher with to defend themselves. Only Valdez calls to report that initiates sent to convoy food found that the town was wiped out and investigating Brotherhood members reported tall green mutants. Because otherwise, Steel Dawn has little to offer Steel Rain. The drama between Romani and Shin was already there prior to Steel Dawn, meaning that if players had just joined right into the middle of Steel Rain, you really wouldn't have missed that much. But the super mutant thing also kind of doesn't go anywhere. I mean, it's totally the focus of the story of Steel Rain, but specifically answering why this attack happened is irrelevant. For example, our next mission is to yet another location we had managed to visit already, where we encounter more primitive mutants living in a cave. Again, why these mutants are here, and if they have anything to do with the ones that attacked Fort Atlas, is kind of a mystery. It's almost like the story beats were just written down, and there was a general through line of, somebody's making new super mutants, but nobody actually put in the work to connect all the dots together cohesively. We have two new initiate characters, although neither of them are the son we recruited in Steel Dawn. That's because one of them is going to die and Shin will injure himself protecting the other from a landmine. Our big clue is that we found a Pip-Boy. It is a weird clue because while the antagonist is using a vault as a base, I don't know how or why a Pip-Boy would have ended up in this location. It almost just feels like a coincidence considering what gets revealed. Valdez is certainly interested in the Pip-Boy, but she has a bigger concern on her mind. Marsha's missing. You know, Marsha. Okay, please believe me here. I did not intentionally exclude this character from past quests. I know that's something that I might do in other scripts, but I promise you I haven't done it here. This is genuinely the first we've heard of Marsha, and we are now diverting the super mutant story to go back to the rocket drama. Marsha and her brother are the only survivors from that settlement that Romani personally slaughtered, and she isn't particularly happy about her whole family getting executed by Romani. She's run off to join the only group actually trying to get rid of the Brotherhood, well, besides us in the Enclave, of course, that being the Raiders. Even though the war party has returned, Pierce still isn't necessary for it. I don't know if the writers backed out of a bigger role for him that the Raiders were going to play in the story. It's just, when a diver is deep enough that they can no longer see anything, eventually their body loses sense of orientation. That's me. 
I've been playing and thinking about this game for so long I've lost orientation on what a good decision in an RPG is even supposed to be. Since I'm also writing about it, if this were the Outer Worlds, here's how this would have gone. You can kill Pierce in the first encounter, but doing so would make any future choice regarding the war party more difficult, if not impossible. That game is so consistent about that, it basically instructs the player to try and find all the details before making any decision about taking lives. Whereas Fallout 4 and 76 have no consistency and also write their characters in such a way that wanting to murder everyone just is normal. Giving the war party bad intelligence on the Brotherhood didn't matter. I've said the choices don't matter to such a degree that I question if they've ever truly mattered. I think having an existential crisis is not a great sign for your story. Fallout 76's DLC storylines are probably some of the worst Bethesda's ever made. Let's just skip the Marsha thing. Romani's investigating missing people which are tied to the PMC we dealt with last quest. Oh no, we can't skip the Marsha thing. There's a PMC now! 27 years after the war, Romani wants to go undercover to look into a caravan company that she thinks is involved. You know, it's very in character for this extremely flawed human being to be more concerned with missing randos in Appalachia than the missing child that she took under her wing or the super mutants which attacked the fort. Marcia is the eldest of the two siblings that we encountered on our journey to Appalachia. There was... an incident that resulted in the death of their mother. Paladin Romani decided that we should bring them along with us instead of leaving them alone. This is one of our own who's gone missing. Despite her resentment towards the Brotherhood, I've come to consider Marcia a friend. I know that life hasn't been easy for her at Fort Atlas, and I'd hate to think that something has happened to her. Think of it as doing a favor for me. But listen... I was hoping we could talk for a few minutes before we head upstairs. Let me buy you a drink. What do you say? Again, compare this with Shen nearly sacrificing his life to save an initiate. Sadly, it is all related. It's always good to have the writer to bail you out of your neuroses. Then we get one of the worst checks in the game. But listen, I was hoping we could talk for a few minutes before we head upstairs. Like, Let me buy you a drink. Like, what do you say? In there or something like that. Like, pretend I was a slave oh, with no. uh, Johnny. Oh, no. <laughs> Why is there a flirt option with the paladin? What? Wait. With Romani? Mm hmm. Are you fucking kidding me? God, no. Ma'am, I am gay. What? We live in the AI voice synthesis era. I might as well. That joke might have tracked better if I wasn't role-playing as an equally insane woman. Delphine and Romani are a power couple that I demand to have shipped together. Just two girl bosses running militaristic factions with specific objectives that they both ignore. This quest proves that the caravan faction we have yet to meet is not the suspect. Also, there's a reuse of the legendary imposter sheep squatch, just in case you haven't done that event yet, except that doesn't make sense because the story of the imposter sheep squatch was that it was artificially created. Hey, we've got the assets, we're gonna reuse them. Unsurprisingly, our and Valdez's investigation into Marsha was accidentally more proactive in revealing a lead on the super mutants than Romani's mission. It's not like knowing who Dr. Blackburn is is actually useful. So, Valdez, being the only competent person in the Appalachian Brotherhood, uses the Pip-Boy to determine it originated from Vault 96. Valdez is so good, she decides she'd rather come with us to the vault this time. After yet another vault dungeon and about 60 audio logs, we have found the missing people and secured Dr. Blackburn. The Blood Eagles who attacked this place ahead of us did most of the hard work. One of them's asking for help, being one of the people we met back during the first quest. Weirdly enough, I don't hate this character and didn't take the opportunity to murder her. Which is great, because it's basically proof that I don't hate all women in this game. Nor do I murder hobo everybody. Hey, don't look at me like that! We'd be dead if you hadn't shown up, if they're not. They soon will be. I try to get these guys here to mount a rescue, they'll ask me themselves. <laughs> ass. Get it? <laughs> ass. She makes a deal with us, stays good on her end, and isn't too annoyingly written. I cannot say the same for the people we were actually supposed to rescue here. Blackburn's only notable trait is that he's voiced by Keith Sharabaika, who played Arandir and several other Dark Elves back in Skyrim. FEV was never intended to be a source of abominations and grotesqueries. It was to be the next step in human evolution. Our refinement into something greater and better. Certainly the fools at West Tech were more obsessed with observing its failures than correcting them. 
but its true purpose was for good. And now it will fulfill that purpose. Years ago, this temple was raided by an orc war party seeking revenge. They were being plagued by nightmares, just like the people of Dawnstar. My knowledge of this temple comes from personal experience. I was a priest of Vermina. When the orcs invaded the temple, I fled. I left my brothers and sisters here to die. I mention this because it's really distracting thinking that Blackburn's going to start talking about how he has to turn people into orcs in the service of Vermina. Not that I hate the guy or anything, I just think it wasn't very cool of Bethesda to pack his voice into probably an hour's worth of audio logs. Because yeah, it feels like the writers did this to preempt any kind of criticism of the story. You can't point out any issues because it's probably in one of these audio logs I also did not listen to. I mean, I will admit, the Steel Rain is at least better of making this a story where each leg serves some function in reaching the conclusion. Quest 1, Super Mutants. 2, Mercenaries. 3, Caravan Kidnappings. All components of the same overarching conspiracy that led to Vault 96. So it's something, I guess. Blackburn may be in custody, but he reveals that there is a backup plan to disperse his FEV strain. He's very self-aware about how awful his experiments were, which is kind of dumb because they literally accomplished nothing. There is no difference between the mutants created in Vault 96 and the mutants that the Enclave created when they released the FEV prior. I mean, the primal mutants are new, sure, but those aren't the ones who attacked Fort Atlas. So everybody moves on over to a West Tech Research Center. The other doctors are sealed off and threaten to release the FEV if we don't release Blackburn. So we do, he turns himself into a super mutant behemoth, we have a boss fight, and then we find the scientists. Shin and Romani have a disagreement over their fate, and so it comes to blows. I mean, it doesn't have to, but come on. We get to choose. And I'm gonna choose, alright. I thought about not specifying what I chose, but then I remembered that during the fight, Romani retreated into a laser grid network which had stopped us from reaching the scientists before. I think it's a fitting cap on this questline to have it break in a way that further damns Romani as a traitor, even if Bethesda never actually intended to make the implication that she'd been in league with these scientists. Well, it would be a fitting cap. Except upon our return to Fort Atlas, we're promoted to the rank of Knight Errant. What does that mean? Well, in terms of retail, we've officially been promoted to customer. Yeah, the Brotherhood of Steel storyline ends with our termination from the company. One of the most accomplished initiates in the chapter and we're told that we're better off leaving and doing our own thing instead. I guess it's unique. Instead of being made the faction leader, the ending of the storyline is us getting fired. It is truly fascinating that more people haven't dedicated themselves to covering these stories. Fallout 76 took a second swing at telling a Brotherhood of Steel story set during an interesting part of their history, spent over a year developing that story, and did almost nothing with that. This could have been 200 years after the founding, given how dedicated these first generation members are already to the cause. Thankfully, Fallout 76 has pretty much entirely run out of steam at this point in its update history. Yeah, Steel Rain is basically the unceremonious conclusion of this accursed product, at least for right now. The only thing that stands between us and the credits is The Pit. But The Pit was deceptive. We were completely prepared to get utterly destroyed by this DLC, but only found ourselves surprised by how quickly it, and ostensibly the entire game, had completely fizzled out. So to start, daily operations are another form of content where you teleport to one of a handful of locations and complete a set of objectives against standardized enemies from one of a handful of factions. You can only get rewarded once per day, and a number of plans and schematics as well as more general rewards like legendaries and bullion are earned by completing this operation under a set time limit, the easiest way of which to fulfill is to simply run it in a public daily op with four players. This is the replacement for the Vault 94 raids released back in 2019, but not as horribly laggy. Expeditions were envisioned as another such replacement, really catering to co-op play through missions set outside Appalachia, the first setting being the Pit. So a bunch of people rebuilt the responders at White Springs, and Modus may have something to do with it, but it's not really a point because the Pit doesn't really have a story. 
We're introduced to the new responders, given a handful of daily quests, and told we need to complete these in order to do the expeditions. The logic is that the vertebrate used to reach Pittsburgh is powered by Ultrasight, which is handed out in limited amounts. After completing these objectives, we're given our batteries and allowed to go on our first expedition. Fun fact, only 2.4% of players have completed both expeditions. There are only two expeditions, but they're so bad that even if we're one to complete the first, they could not be bothered to do the daily quests required in order to complete the second. We managed to bypass the achievement as, there being two of us here, we were able to do both expeditions in one day. It is funny to think that if I had been reviewing this alone, then I would have arbitrarily been forced to play Fallout 76 for another day. The upside is that these were actually co-op content. These mediocre, boring missions can at least be done with your friends. It's hilarious. The Vertebra ride and the scene where we first arrive in the pit really sets a feeling of potential for this DLC. Only for you to realize that it's just a daily op themed after a DLC from Fallout 3. Remember Fallout 3? To emphasize, you aren't really visiting a new area of the map. You can't loot as much as usual. The story's very basic and doesn't actually go anywhere since more weren't made. We're supposed to care because dealing with the problems in Pittsburgh, which Fallout 3 spoilers, we won't, is supposed to help New Virginia in preventing a refugee crisis. I like that moving to Appalachia is treated as absurd, and then we go to the pit and it's like five million times worse than anything in West Virginia. It was also great getting to the end of the second expedition and realizing, much sooner than we were expecting, that it was over. We were done with Fallout 76. I... I feel drained. <laughs> Like, I am shell-shocked. I am baffled by how fuck bad that was. That was worse than Wastelanders, honestly. We just sat at my base and began a mutual therapy session. The game couldn't even sync the weather between us, but we watched it anyways. Legitimately, our last three hours of playing Fallout 76 were just us sitting in place, unpacking what a disaster of a game this had been. Like, all right, so where do we even, where do we even begin? I, I think, I think the appropriate place to start is to like, like open up with this game did not have its redemption arc. Anybody who believes that has not actually played. There's no way you can play this game and go through all of this content and think that this is, this is improving because it's not. And, as if Bethesda wanted to make the moment perfect, the final 30 minutes of our conversation had a countdown until the game servers were to be shut down for maintenance. That countdown ticked for every second, all 1800 of them, and we still talked through it. Shut down imminent, wow. Fucking <laughs> 30 minute <laughs> countdown to get fucked. I think, there we go, that's the perfect ambience. Yeah. <laughs> it's just ticking clock. <laughs> you could literally couldn't get better. It's really funny that one of the one of the only things this game had that got a content update made about it that was genuine to this game we didn't get to play, which was Mothman. <laughs> Cuz Mothman's from 76. He's a 76 yeah. thing. Yeah. So the fact that the one content update that was genuinely Fallout 76 can't play that. You can play the steel, the Brotherhood of Steel, and the the Wastelanders, and the, and pit, the pit, Nuka World, and the stories are so awful in the <laughs> DLC. <laughs> They're insultingly bad when they aren't just outright insulting. Where it, and they just they just forget things like. The fact that the Enclave exists just never is just never brought up again. The fact that we have nukes never brought up again. All these different things. This fuck scorched plague. We cured it. Everybody drank their Nuka Cola. So that's it. Mm -hmm. It's over. There's no commitment in this game. That's yeah. That's the problem. I the could thing. literally stand up and go right behind me, and completely <laughs> switch my build to something different. Yeah. Which like, I kind of appreciated in this game. That's I why... appreciate it because everything else is broken. Yeah. And the last thing something this broken needs is, is that kind of commitment. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, imagine if you hit, like, level 50, 60 or whatever, mm -hmm. 
you, you're done. Like, 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 imagine that's what happened. You hit, like, level 50, and then you're just done picking perk cards. And then it's just like, what you got is what you got. Especially since there's an RNG aspect to it as well. This rad storm has been going on for a long time. You have a rad storm? Yeah. Oh, for me, it's beautiful sunset. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that That's actually amazing. <laughs> so e even something as simple as sitting down and looking out over the edge isn't consistent. Nope. Yeah, the forest is nothing but rad storm on my screen. Oh, the forest. Oh no, you trust me. It would look you it would be very noticeable. Oh yeah, yeah. I I can see the forest. I send like you a picture of what I'm seeing. Dunked on. Oh, maybe not. It is in front of us. Oh no, no, that's not. <laughs> that's not what I'm seeing right now. Yeah, like I said, you would have noticed. It's literally just like a beautiful sunset for me. I I, I would say this is probably the best world Bethesda's made. Yeah, I, I would say so as well. the The way it does Dun biome distinction. Mm -hmm. and the dungeon design is really solid, and you know they ditched a lot of the bad i a lot of the bad shit that i was talking about in uh the skyrim video yeah the problem is that now we don't have a fucking local map so, so yeah so like it, they made it more confusing than they took away your local mapping the map in, the map in general i don't understand why we couldn't have had both the um regular style and the the stylized map yeah like this map you know, it's cool and all, but at the same time, it's not very like. It, I guess it was it was a neat detail that um, we went to that lake and it wasn't there. Yeah. Oh, hang yeah, on. yeah. Fuck government's on my lawn. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I'm watching like the rain weather system just move across the map. <laughs> Get anything good out of that? Fell through the map. Ah. But the the pit definitely felt like some idea that they're just like, alright, we're we're just gonna throw this at the wall, we'll see if it sticks. Yeah, I mean it's nostalgia. Yeah. I could put it nostalgia under everything in this game pretty much yeah yeah other than like not mothman but yeah th that's what it is it's, it, it feels like they were testing some ideas there with the pit to see like what sort of easy content can they produce that they can slap a coat like a coat of paint across and get people to buy into it and the weird thing is you make a tile set, you can use it to uh, make other areas. You think there would have been yeah. at least another expedition with like each patch, you know, just to kind of fill out the roster. And that's kind of the recurring story of this game that I've noticed when I was looking at updates was like, there's a lot of cut content there. There's a lot of cut content there. <clears throat> Remember those updates we did where we would do the update and it was like everything had been cut yeah. or like how Wastelanders was supposed to have like six daily quests. And it has three. That's cr that blows my mind that Wastelanders has been out this long. Wa doing Wastelanders, collecting gold bullion and stuff, it's still like an active part of most people's mm -hmm. daily grind. And they still haven't just gone back and added a few more quests. It's the same fucking quest since the thing launched in. What was that, 29, 2018? 20. Yeah. 2020, Wastelanders came out? Yeah, it's just... It's been out two years, three years almost at this point, and it's still... They still haven't gone back and just... But I guess that's because what they're trying to do is just expand, just create more stuff, add more... Just, just keep just, going, just keep saying, make... you know, the list of feature... The feature list is getting longer, mm -hmm. What we can say the game has is getting to longer. To attract more attract more players i'm really curious what their like player retention numbers look like how many players leave and just never come back how many people are one of those monthly players where they just you know come back every few months run it for a month and then leave 
I think there's. And then how many yeah, I think like, it's got to be. There's people out there who, who they do a run through of Fallout Four, and maybe they want more. Mm -hmm. And they they've heard. I think we do have to sell. It's not Fallout Four. No. It even it's if not multiplayer even if you Fallout get, Four. Even yeah, even if you get Fallout first, make your own private server or whatever, and play it without any other players and stuff. It's still not Fallout Four. And it never should have been conceptualized as such. No. You know, with GTA Online, its updates, the quality of its updates got better with time. Mm -hmm. It was started out bad and it was really bad for a couple of years, but then they started doing updates that gave players more of what they wanted and were cool yeah. kind of content updates. Well, and that's the thing is like, you would expect the first few updates to be like them trying to yeah, your get, wild Appalachia, yeah. you know, your scoreboard update. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's there's some basics that need to be hammered out, like some things that people are really clamoring for. So you take care of that real fast. You figure out, like, you really dial in what this game is about because it's, it's an online game. You don't know how people are really going to play it. But, like, after two years or so, like I said, the pit, really, like, we sh this game should be in its prime. Like, the, the Brotherhood of Steel stuff, and the pit should have been stellar compared to everything else. Mm -hmm. It should not have been progressively getting worse. And it's clear that they don't know what they want to do with it. They don't know what the players want. I don't think they understand what the players, why the players play this game. Yeah, it, it probably mystifies them. My ultimate question is, what is this game? What is it meant to be? Who is it meant for? I've played this game for like 150 hours now, and I feel like I have more answer. I'm I'm further away from answering that question than when I began. Yeah, if we had thrown a, a dart before we had played a single hour, we could probably. I I feel like that's false confidence, and I feel like that's why the, this is necessary yeah. because a lot of people think they know this game, and I don't think they do. Oh, there's an issue. <laughs> okay, so now this is funny. Are you ready for this? Yeah. The achievement to complete both of the expeditions has a global achievement rate of 2.2%. Oh. So Ooh. it is basically universal that um, players Keep do one of those expeditions and or get turned off and just go absolutely not. <laughs> the proof is right there. 2.2 percent christ because remember the according to then, their release the release at the end of this year uh, at the end of the last year they have more players playing than they have before like this yeah. this was a record year for them so two percent what the fuck there is not an achievement in dark souls that has a 2.2 percent completion rate <laughs> no seriously the achievement to get all of the achievements has a completion rate of five percent in dark souls oh my god God. And there's some serious like completionist That's style bad. achievements where And we can't even and, dude, we can't even say that there's games that people are playing right now. This was one of the slowest fucking years. This was the this was the time for people to come back to Fallout 76 and just play through because nothing was releasing this year. Oh my god, look at that. A, a person. Player yeah, a player walking or walking around. It's just it, it's weird that nobody's talking about this either. That pit the pit exp expedition stuff made no waves whatsoever. I didn't see anybody talk about it. I think because everybody everybody who is in the know knows that after after Steel Rain, what could be have been done? What can you do? What can you do? The game, the game is treading water. No, the game is saved. Remember, it had its redemption arc. I'd be really curious just how many people are are spreading that message. Well, so just go and read the Steam reviews. Do you know this game has like a seventy three percent? I think. Oof. Yeah, because I remember on the Wikipedia page it said that people there were Steam reviews trying to spread the message that the game had been fixed. And it was like comparisons to No Man's Sky. Yeah. Dude, No Man's Sky is so much better than this. 
<laughs> well, at least that game has a coherent central gameplay loop. Mm -hmm. It has an actual sense of design, a strong yeah. vision. Yeah. Somebody had I... an idea and they executed upon it. And when they went to go, went to fix it, they they didn't abandon kept, it. They kept that idea core. They and look, just... I hate having to maintain fifteen health bars, but it's very clear that that's the there way are... that they want it to be. That that's the way they want it to be, and that's what it it, it ended up resonating with with an audience. So, but when you have two percent of people completing your uh, your. DLC, your major DLC mm -hmm. for the year. Remember, Expedition, like this was the hyped thing. This is what they've been promising for a while now. Yeah, we'll be able to, because you know it's a framework so that they can go, and then we're going to have a DC Expedition, we're going to have yeah. a Boston Expedition, and then we can start adding cities that like people want to see, like maybe we'll go to Atlanta, or yeah. uh, Nashville, Memphis, uh, st louis you know if you want to if you really want to go the distance but i mean like yeah there's all sorts of options for expeditions to see different american cities showcased in the fallout universe and uh i don't see that happening if uh if if this is just... if this is what it is yeah yeah it seems yeah like... why why would i want to do that though cool it's a new location there's, there's the going to be play, some kind of ghoulish monster and some kind of dumb raider gang. Yeah. Ooh. It was, that was so fucking boring. That might have been one of the one of the most boring parts of this game. Yeah, because now we have this wonderful narrative of just this continuous descent into just and this fits exactly what I wanted to do with GTA Online. Like, this has been the perfect kind of test bed for ideas mm -hmm. for that video. And I'm shocked that I'm in, living in a world where GTA Online does better content <laughs> updates than <laughs> Bethesda. <laughs> El Cayo Perico is worth more than all of the DLC that's in this game. <laughs> and for all the dirty sh** that, that Rockstar's done with that game... Yeah. Uh, but setting up a system where griefers are like the economy, basically. Um, <laughs> the, the, it is very pay to win environment and pay to not get annoyed kind of shit. And yeah. um, we made these problems and you're going to pay for the solution. And yet their content updates have more <laughs> fucking meat to them in terms of what you do, the story that they're telling and the mechanics that are involved. Um, I like that Campfire Tales is starting when there's 30 seconds left before we get kicked out. <laughs> uh, it's sad. It really is. See them cows? I can kill them from up here. <laughs> disconnected from server if you've watched this video then you know what i mean when i say that fallout 76 did not have a redemption arc i get if you're one of the gamblers playing hoping to one day get that three star fixer with all three effects that you want to drop but i think the best thing for this game is to have its map and soundtrack ported into fallout 4 and then to have the game servers taken out back and slapped with a giant magnet the best PR the DLC could have hoped for was that the launch of 76 was so disastrous. If Fallout 76 had just launched as a mediocre game, its main quest would have had its fair share of defenders. I mean, look at Fallout 3, people are borderline having drive-bys over that game. Then if the story DLC had launched as is, they would have thoroughly been criticized. But because the game launch was such a train wreck, few people have played it for any meaningful appreciation. Everybody just wants to talk about Nuka-Cola rum and that one update that undid some patching. Meaning that a hardened core of fans who will defend pretty much anything with Fallout branding on it have gradually twisted the narrative that this game is anything more than what I have presented. It is a failure of genre. It's not multiplayer Fallout, it's not a co-op looter shooter, it's not a survival game, and it's not an MMO. If you want any of those, there are better experiences that I could recommend. 7 out of 10. 
You stand accused of treason to the blades. How do you plead? Oh, I, I didn't do it. Every time I sit in this chair, it spawns more enemies. Now, how, what do you say, Esburn? You sided with the Dragonborn over me. I can't use my stim packs. Goodbye. <laughs> oh my god. 